One of the distinctive characteristics of transition metals is their formation of coloured ions, which means that transition metals can be identified by their colour. Colour arises when some of the wavelengths of visible light are absorbed. For example, if white light is incident on a sample, some of the light is absorbed due to the transition metal having an incomplete D subshell. We only observe the wavelengths of light that are transmitted or reflected. And so, if red, yellow and green light are absorbed, the remaining transmitted light will appear blue, as it is the complementary colour. This works with reflection from solid samples too. When white light is incident on a solid object, if violet and blue light are absorbed, the remaining light will be reflected and the observer will see the object as being orange. And so solutions will transmit the light that is not absorbed and solid samples will reflect the light that is not absorbed. And this absorption is due to the transition metal having an incomplete D subshell. And so something that does not have an incomplete D subshell cannot absorb visible light and so will not appear to be coloured. Now that we know that substances absorb and transmit different colours, let's explore why this happens and why the colours are different for different metals. When ligands bond to transition metals, the five orbitals that are in the D subshell split into different energy levels. And you can see this from the diagram that I'm showing here. On the left hand side, without ligands, we have five D orbitals with the same amount of energy. And then with ligands, two or three of the orbitals have a higher energy than the others. Any electrons in the D subshell will exist in the lowest energy state, and this is called the ground state. D electrons will move from the ground state to an excited state when light is absorbed. And the light absorbed needs to give the electrons enough energy to move from the ground state to the excited state. Delta E is the symbol for this energy difference between the ground state and the excited state. Different wavelengths of light have different amounts of energy. And so delta E corresponds to the wavelengths of light that are absorbed by the metal compound. Since delta E is different for the different metals, this means that different wavelengths of light will be absorbed and transmitted, and so we will see different colours for the different metals. The energy difference between the ground state and the excited state determines the wavelength of light absorbed, and we can calculate it using Planck's equation delta E equals HV where delta E is the energy difference measured in joules, H is the Planck constant, which has a value of 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds, and V equals the frequency of the light absorbed, measured in hertz or seconds to the minus 1. Frequency and wavelength are linked together in the wave equation, where wave speed equals frequency multiplied by wavelength. Wave speed is in metres per second and wavelength should be in metres. Sometimes you will be given a wavelength in nanometers and a nanometer is a billion times smaller than a metre. So to convert nanometers into a metre, you will have to divide this number by a billion. This means that we can actually go back to the energy difference equation and have a substituted form for it where delta E equals Planck's constant multiplied by wave speed divided by wavelength. And this tells us that a smaller energy difference will mean longer wavelengths of light, so lower energy will be absorbed, while a larger energy difference will mean shorter wavelengths of light are absorbed, so in other words, higher energy. If an atom or ion has a completely full D subshell, there is no available space for the electrons to be excited, and so it can't absorb visible light and will appear colourless.
Different transition metal compounds have different colours because the energy difference, delta E, varies between metals. But even complexes of the same transition metal can appear different colours. And this is due to a number of factors, such as changes in oxidation state or coordination number or changes to the ligand. All three of these will alter this energy difference. And since delta E equals HC over lambda, this will affect the wavelength of light absorbed. And this will lead to a change in the colour observed. For example, if we have the hexa aqua iron 2 complex, this will be a green solution. But if the oxidation state of the iron changes from plus 2 to plus 3 for no change to the ligand, the colour will change to be a yellow solution. As a second example, if we have a copper 2 plus complex with four ammonia ligands and two water ligands, it will appear to be a dark blue solution. But if all six of those ligands are substituted for four chloride ligands, this change to the coordination number and change to the ligand will lead to the complex now having a yellow-green colour. A very common exam question would be one that asks you why a particular complex has a particular colour. And the standard response that I recommend you use would be to start by saying that visible light is absorbed when D electrons are excited and that only a particular colour of light is transmitted or reflected. And so you would only need to personalise this and vary it slightly from one complex to another depending on the colour. So for instance, why is the hexa aqua iron 2 complex green? Well, you would say that visible light is absorbed and D electrons are excited and only green light is transmitted or reflected and the rest of the light is absorbed. You could also be asked why a particular metal compound appears to be a white solid or a colourless solution. And so you would need to say that this is because they have a full D sublevel or they have no D electrons at all. And so that means that they cannot absorb visible light. And so that's why they appear to be white or colourless, because all of the light is transmitted or reflected. As well as being able to see different colours of complexes with the naked eye, the absorption of visible light is used in spectroscopy. An example of this is the use of a colorimeter, which is a machine that measures the absorbance or transmittance of different frequencies of light. A simple colorimeter can be used to determine the concentration of coloured ions in solution, as well as to identify complexes and study their electronic structure. A simple colorimeter will have a source of white light that emits light of all the different frequencies. And then we have a coloured filter which absorbs the majority of light and it selects the wavelengths of light that are most strongly absorbed by the sample. So in my case I'm showing a red filter and that will absorb all of the frequencies of light except red. And then we have a space for our sample which will be in a container and I'm choosing to have a blue sample and that's why I've selected a red filter because blue samples absorb the colour red very well. And so different concentrations of our blue sample will give a different absorbance of this red light. And after the light has passed through our sample, it hits a detector. And this detector will give us a graph of absorbance of this light versus the concentration of our sample. In order to know that the absorbance is only due to the sample and not some other factors, we need to make sure we set the absorbance to zero with distilled water in a sample container before we measure the absorbance of our specific sample. It's important to make sure that the sample containers are always the same width because the path length that the light travels through is directly proportional to the absorbance. In other words, a wider sample container would absorb more light.
This process is much quicker to analyse samples than something such as titrations, and it also enables us to use a much smaller volume of our sample, and in fact, we can reuse our sample after it has been analysed. You need to be able to describe how we can use colorimetry to determine an unknown concentration for a sample of something, for instance, a solution containing copper two ions. And to do this, the first stage would involve the production of a calibration curve. To use a colorimeter to produce a calibration curve, we need to measure the absorbance for a range of known concentrations, and then plot a graph of absorbance versus concentration. The first thing that we would need to do is have our reference sample. This would be a sample container with just distilled water in it, and we would reset the colorimeter so that the absorbance for this sample was zero. And this makes sense because if our concentration for our sample is zero, the absorbance should be zero. And then we would substitute this sample container for one containing hexa aqua copper 2 plus with a known concentration and we would measure that absorbance. And then we would substitute this out for a different concentration of copper 2 plus, measure that absorbance, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one. And we would keep repeating this until we have enough data to see the trend line for our graph of absorbance versus concentration. And we would connect those points with a line of best fit and that needs to go through the origin because if our concentration is zero, the absorbance should be zero. And then we would take our solution with an unknown concentration and put that into the colorimeter. We would measure the absorbance of this sample and we would refer to our graph. We would find this absorbance on our graph and we would read across to our best fit line. And then we would read down to the X axis and read off the value for the concentration for this measured absorbance from the graph.